the video will be posted. Okay. Like you said, I finished my PhD this summer in June, and now I'm going to give uh, a talk about the main topics of my thesis. And maybe I'd like to begin by thanking Nordida for giving me this opportunity to give this talk. Uh, I will start with uh, giving a short overview of what gamma reverse R and also the standard fireball model that is used uh, extensively, extensively to interpret afterglows, gamma reverse afterglows. Then I will uh, present you the model I have been working on for the last three years, which is an extension to the standard fireball model where we include energy injections and also, also we have been exploring uh, different density profiles than the, than the constant density and the simple wind model, which I will talk about later. Uh, <coughs> then I'll uh, continue to talk about the, the uh, emission properties, which is mainly believed to be synchrotron radiation. And I will discuss some power law approximations we make to to increase the, or de decrease the computational time of the model. Uh, <coughs> I have that developed a fitting procedure to fit my model to afterglow data, and I will show you some examples of afterglows that I have fitted. Uh, we have also <coughs> used a model to explore the, the accuracy of the standard method of fitting afterglow light curves with simple broken power law, which uh, <coughs> is not used as much now, but has been used in the past to infer some parameters from the from the standard model. And then I will conclude my talk. Now, <coughs> gamma reverse are in general short duration uh, for a few milliseconds to a few hundred seconds release of high energy gamma ray photons in the sub mega Allison walk winds. Uh, they are highly irregular uh, uh, light curves, but the spectra show some uh, signs of, of being synchrotron emission most of the time. Uh, here are examples of prompt emission light curves, and these are actually those that are occurred in May 2000, I think, uh, at 19, 20, and 21st. So, it's just three bursts that pick randomly showing the variation from a smooth bump to highly irregular curves. Now, they are usually classified into two subsets, which are short hard burst, which with duration less than two seconds, and then long soft, with duration greater than two seconds. Uh, although there has been some dispute lately uh, due to observations of a long gamma ray burst which had, which had no supernova component. Uh, but it's still unknown whether it's really a long or a short burst. This depends on the definition of how you categorize them. But there are mainly these two groups. Uh, the short bursts are believed to occur in the merger of compact objects double Newton star or Newton star and the black hole, while the long ones uh, seem to occur in the core collapse of, of massive stars. And I have been mainly mm, interested in, in the afterglows of long ones since short af uh, afterglows of short bursts have only recently been observed. Now, in the standard fireball model, I see the sentence between the picture and uh, we have a progenitor, which in this case is a massive star, and you form uh, a black hole or, or some sort of central, central engine which emits a jet or, or a double jet in this direction which breaks through the surface of the star uh, and reaches uh, relativistic speeds with a lot of factor greater than, than 100. Uh, and it's usually assumed that the jet has a half opening angle of theta, which is around five degrees. So uh, <coughs> there are variations in the outflow, which cause uh, 
uh, internal shocks, which are believed to be the origin of the gamma ray emission, and further uh, interaction with the external medium creates a forward shock, which is believed to uh, drive the afterglow. Now, in the standard model, the, the uh, forward shock or, the, or the, the outflow is supposed to collide together in the, in the <coughs> internal shocks and we only have a single initial energy injection into the forward shock. Uh, what we have explored is a distribution of, of, of mass, that is uh, the mass ejected into the forward shock doesn't uh, mass ejected from the central engine does not all collide in the internal shocks but some of it uh, uh, remains intact and later, later uh, refreshes the forward shock so if we look at the here we can see the plot of the mass that has lower factor greater than, than gamma so this is accumulated plot and we have uh, an initial release here and in the green plot we have several discrete shells coming in and refreshing the shock as it slows down and then the red curve shows uh, a simple power lock which we have also explored and was initially explored by Masaros and Rees in 1998 to calculate the, the dynam dynamics of the shells we assume uh, the evolution is adiabatic so we can apply energy and momentum conservation uh, this is really not uh, hydrodynamic or hydrodynamic or code. We just assume we have these lumps of mass traveling in an external medium, and only the leading shell or the forward shock is slowed down due to the sweeping of external muscle. Other shells just keep their, their speed until they collide and see forward shock. Here we can see uh, a cartoon representation of, of this. Here we have in the beginning three shells the first one has, has the greatest speed the second one has uh, a somewhat higher and then the third one is, is slowest as the first one feeds up the external man it slows down and shell number two uh, gradually catches up with it and until finally it collides with it uh, <coughs> we assume the collisions are instantaneous which is a fair approximation uh, when we consider the effect of, of, of the curvature of the front that is, there is a, is a, is a time delay in the emission of, of an electron, of a photon at the, at the line of sight and at the edges of the shell I will come explain that better later and <coughs> we also assume that the, that the leading shock expands sideways at the co-moving speed of sound which is approximately uh, the speed of light <coughs> now to calculate the, the emission we need to have some we need to know the properties of the leading shell or the forward shock now we simplify things by assuming it's locally homogeneous and the properties are derived from the shock jump conditions here I have plotted two curves the black one is our approximation while the blue one is the self-similar solution uh, by Blanford and McKee which is also extensively used in the, in the afterglow in afterglow science <coughs> but it has also been shown that the difference between the two approximations is, is not very much. Now, <coughs> the, this shock jump condition gives us the, the energy density and the, the density of the, of the forward shock or the, or the emitting shell and to get the energy of the electron population and the, ele and the energy in the magnetic field we just assume they are fixed proportions called the natural E and natural B with thermal energy of the leading shell 
This is just a way of, of hiding microphysics into two simple parameters. And <coughs> we also assume that the injected electron energy distribution in the forward shock is a simple power law between uh, a minimum and the maximum Lorentz factor. And then uh, the electrons cool by emitting radiation, so we get a break in the electron distribution at a characteristic Lorentz factor called gamma C, or cooling gamma. <coughs> now, this results in a synchrotron spectra, which can be approximated with broken power loss. This is what shows here a pure synchrotron spectra from uh, an electron population with a broken power law distribution. You can see there is a rise here which has a slope of, of one third. Then there is a second here with a slope of, of p over two, minus p over two. And then here is another slope with minus p plus one over two. So it can be fairly well approximated with this proven power loss. And what we do is we smooth the, uh, the trends of the broken power loss so the so we, it, it results in an approximation which is which differs most at most by 40 percent for for the parameters we are concerned about. But it's mainly it differs about five to ten percent, which is good enough for what we are doing. Now <coughs> we also include synchrotron self absorption, which causes a break at low frequency, as you can see by the green line. And we also include inverse content effects, which increases the, the cooling of the electrons and also creates a small bump at high frequency. You maybe see it here, the purple line it rises just above the, the blue line at, at high energy. This bump is actually highly dependent on the, on the density and the magnetic field of the forward shock. So it seems just examples. Now, there are mainly two relativistic effects we have to take into account. And the first one is like I talked about earlier, the curvature effect is that if we are, if the observer is here on the right, and a photon emitted at the line of sight here, and it has to travel a distance that is it's with that's the shorter than a photon emitted at an angle here. <coughs> uh, this has an effect that photons emitted simultaneously in the local frame arrive at an interval in the observer's frame. So uh, another cause of this is that instead of having just two time scales, that is the time scale of the central engine and the and the co-moving frame or the or the still frame of, of the forward shock. We have a third time, which is the observer time, which has to take this delay into account. Uh, <coughs> this, yeah, this, and also there is also uh, uh, cosmological reticent involved. Now, <coughs> the second part is that we have a limited view of the front uh, due to beaming of photons. That is, photons emitted uh, perpendicular to the to the in the in the co-moving frame are beamed into an opening angle of one over gamma, approximately. So at the beginning, when the when the when gamma is high enough, we are only viewing a limited size of the forward shock. Uh, <coughs> Now, this has the effect that uh, while the beaming angle is less than the opening angle of the jet, the evolution of the, of the afterglow can be considered to be spherically symmetric. But <coughs> as we see more and more of the jet, we, start, we, we will in the end see the edges of the jet, and then we will, uh, we will have a steepening of the light curve. It has been observed in, in several afterglows. Now, 
this all results, that is the energy injections, results in either a bumpy light curve or a light curve that is slow, uh, that revolves slower than the standard model. In this plot you see the blue line is the standard fiber model with a single instantaneous energy release and the red line here in the plot on the right is with a power law mass release with an energy index, index uh, or a power law index of, of 2 while the plot on the right shows what happens if you add an energy injection, injection uh, of, of the same size as the initial energy release, release. And here you can see, even though the collision is instantaneous in the local frame, we get smooth increase in the observer string. And this is due to the curvature effect. That is, uh, when the <coughs> when the <coughs> Uh, let me go back. Right. And it's when the shells collide to instantaneously brighten or increase the luminosity uh, on all, uh, uh, at the same time on the whole front, but the photon that gets re brightened at the line of sight arrives earlier than photon uh, at some angle. Now, we have also looked at uh, changing the, the, the structure of the external density profile and have found that some light curve variations may also be explained uh, by this method. And here I, I have plotted uh, a density profile that is somewhat similar to, to numerical simulations of, of wolf rayet external density profile. It's sort of a toy model for the external density of those kind of stars, which are believed to be the progenitors of long term universes. Now, <coughs> when it comes to fitting procedure, uh, we minimize the chi square to find the best fit and to get uh, a decent uh, estimate of, of of all the parameters of the model, we need good spectral coverage, we need radio observations, we need optical and we need x-ray to constrain the whole parameter set of the afterglow. There are in general six parameters in the standard afterglow model that have to be constrained. Uh, <coughs> but the problem is that even though we get good spectral coverage, the model is nonlinear and the parameter sets are somewhat degenerate. This causes many local minima in the chi-square which kind of cripple traditional gradient-based fitting methods. So we need a global minimization method which searches the whole parameter space simultaneously. Now, what I have been using is a method called evolution strategy which is based on, on, on an evolutionary model. Uh, we start with with a number of, of random parameter sets, which we can call the individuals of a group we are, we are evolving. Uh, we sort these parameter sets based on the chi-square, that is the best, best parameter set survive. Uh, <coughs> now, every parameter set has initially uh, a Gaussian search distribution which covers the whole parameter space and create in every iteration new parameter sets from the from a number of the best uh, or from the me best parameter sets by varying their parameters within this Gaussian distribution. So <coughs> so we can say that if we have a good parameter set we vary the parameters of that a little bit and <coughs> and uh, hopefully they will be better than the parameter set we had before. Uh, but in order to, to stop the, the search or to uh, uh, shape the search distribution uh, to the landscape of the chi-square function, we, we vary it using a, a log normal distribution in its iterations, so it, it adjusts to, 
to the structure of the Kashgar and we get uh, a final point which is a good uh, estimate of the of the global minimum. There is no guarantee that you will find the the actual global minimum because this is uh, the chi square is, is is highly complex and 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 I've actually actually seen there is there's evolution of, of phase changes if you look at the chi square function. So <coughs> you can never be sure that you that you get the the best that you get a really good approximation for the <coughs> and here I have several examples of, of afterglow phase. Uh, 990510 is, is basically uh, the, the afterglow to fit that we want to use the standard afterglow model because it, it, <coughs> it can be very well fitted with just the standard model. Uh, here we have uh, optical bands, x ray, and, and radio operations. And you see here uh, around one day that we have a steepening in the light curve due to the, the collimation of the outflow. <coughs> and this is basically just... You mentioned that you had six independent parameters that you fitted. Yes. So, I mean, in the, in the standard spherical instantaneous ejection model, you have four. So which other two do you have? Uh, you have four. Yeah, energy density and epsilon sub B and epsilon sub E. And so P, also. You also P. Oh, so, okay, so you had a fifth. So, which is your sixth? It's uh, the opening angle. Oh, the opening angle. Yeah. Okay. So, and there's also also two other parameters that, that can have effect, but their effect is minimal. It's it's basically the viewing angle of the observer. Is it viewing uh, the on on the on the line or the center of uh, a mission, or is it viewing off axis? So and. There's also the, the initial Lorentz factor of the outflow, which, if it gets low enough, it can affect the evolution. And that is actually, actually comes from the, is coupled to the evolution of the, of the expansion. So you have a small effect in these two parameters, but I, I mostly exclude them from the, from the fitting procedure. So this, the, the, the genesis that you were talking about, I mean, uh, it's not obvious, I mean, uh, what the degeneracies are. I mean, I mean, the thing is that, I mean, that what's hard to do the fitting is to uh, decide what's the cooling friction, frequency and what's the uh, injection so that it's... Yes, useful. you have, you have this. I mean, and that has nothing to do with degeneracies, it's just what you think, how you identify the observables. That's usually the, the, the hardest thing when you try to fit an afterglow model is to decide what the critical frequencies are. Yes. Okay, so the, the theory is maybe not in, in, in the model, but in the in uh, exactly deciding the position of this, uh, because you can get a very similar, like if you change the initial energy, and then you can get, by decreasing the the <coughs> the density and the parameters epsilon e and epsilon b, you can get uh, a similar light curve and spectra. They are the effects of the parameters are, are somewhat similar. I actually I can, wow. can show you later. I have a copy of my my thesis where I explore the the effects of, of varying this parameter. And, and yeah, we should go to, uh, through details maybe um, after that, that's enough time. Okay. Yeah. But uh, at the moment we have 18 minutes and before he has to leave yeah. for a meeting. Okay. <laughs> so if you could come in. I will continue. Here yes. I have uh, GFB 010222, which <coughs> was somewhat problematic because, uh, uh, first of all, it occurred in a Starburst galaxy, which made the, there was some sub millimeter observations or millimeter observations of the of the afterglow which were drowned in the in the emission from the host galaxy. And, and you can see that in the radio light curve also that the points here after ten days is most likely just the host. So there is no afterglow detection. These are all just upper limits. And there's also a question whether this is 
uh, missing from the afterglow just the host itself. But <coughs> there was also, uh, uh, by using the, the standard method of, of fitting with, with this broken power loss, uh, <coughs> you couldn't get the parameters of the light curve and the spectra to fit uh, jointly. And <coughs> what my supervisor, Gulli, actually proposed was to add uh, a continuous energy injections to, to actually uh, mm, uh, decrease the, the slope of the, of the afterglow without changing the spectrum. Uh, what I found when fitting with the, this detailed model was that I could just as well fit it with the standard model here shown with solid lines. The lines here are, are with, the, with the density profile I showed you earlier, which gives uh, a slightly better fit, mostly due to the changes in the ratio uh, up below. And here we have a continuous energy, energy distribution, which actually ends at around 0.3 days. So it does not have an effect on the, on the afterglow after that. So what this tells us is basically that the standard, uh, the method of, of fitting with a broken power of both the spectrum and, and light curves uh, <coughs> can, of, can sometimes give uh, incorrect, or, 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 or you must at least uh, uh, be careful when you when you apply this method. Um, and actually, you can see here in the right figure, we have a strange evolution of the radio article. This is actually because the best fit was not to have an increase in density, but to have a decrease. The afterglow uh, or the forward shock actually entered the void there and just stopped decaying and, and kept on glowing at, at, uh, or kept the constant luminosity there for quite some time. Now, there's also here the O2 Channel 4, which is famous for being very well observed. You have coverage in in optical up to infrared and in, in millimeter and radio and also two points in x-ray and uh, highly densely sampled light curves which shows uh, some variations here that can be seen. This is just the standard afterglow model uh, which in general can explain, uh, can explain the general behavior but not the, the the intrinsic uh, fluctuations, but if we add here five discrete energy injections, uh, they occur here in the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. The fifth one needed to explain the the ratio light curves. Uh, we can <coughs> uh, really get the the detailed features. So, so this. Uh, is uh, an indication that uh, <coughs> at least in some afterglows we have late time energy injections in the forward shock. So um, does it fit that much better in the afterglow uh, in the radio? Uh, not really in the radio, no, but definitely in the optical. And it's also so in the next slide there are some polarization measurements of this afterglow and uh, synchrotron light can be polarized if we have have uh, an, an anti-symmetry in the magnetic field, or in our case, in the in the <coughs> it's geometrical. We break the geometric uh, symmetry of the geometry when we view the the jet of axis, and this is all explained in the paper by Kiselini and Lasati, and I will not go into it in details. We just incorporated their model in, into ours. And you can see that the instantaneous injections just there is no polarization here at the beginning. But when I, when we add the discrete injections we get we, we get nearly all points here in our fit. And we can see that the top line here was the 
five injections with a different density profile which cannot fit the, the polarization measurement. But <coughs> this is, however, however a, a maybe a weak condition because we also tried to fit uh, GRP0303 to 9, which shows also some variations in the light curve which we actually can't fit with energy injections. And the polarization is is way, uh, we just can't fit the polarization measurement either with this model. So there may be more to the polarization than just the geometrical symmetry. There might be some, some anti-symmetry in the mag mag magnetic field itself. Now, <coughs> as I mentioned in, the, mentioned in the beginning, we also explored the method of fitting afterglows with broken power loss, but the standard model predicts that the light curve in general follows, at least the optical light curves follow this behavior that you have uh, an, is, an in initial slope alpha 1, a jet break time, and then another slope alpha 2. Uh, and you can estimate P from both alpha 1 and alpha 2, and the initial opening angle can be estimated from the, from the jet break. Uh, if you have some estimate of the of the density and the initial energy, although it's not uh, really it's power of one six instead of, of, of square root, so it's not highly dependent on it. Now, <coughs> like I said, this is commonly used to estimate the collimation angle, and the collimation angle has been used uh, by Frail to correct the isotropic equivalent energy release. Uh, which resulted in a narrow distribution of the of the energy needed for the for the camera was jet. And Girlanda uh, went one step forward and extended the the Amati relation, which shows a correlation between the the, uh, the Amati relation shows a correlation between the isotropic energy and the peak of the of the prompt spectrum. And he showed that there was even even stronger correlation between the isotropic, the the corrected. And this shouldn't read isotropic. This should read uh, uh, collimation corrected energy, and the camera reverse peak energy. And he has been using this correlation to constrain cosmological parameters of the standard cosmological models. But our question was, are these results robust? So we used a model to create a, a virtual world where we numerically created a large population of afterglow light curves. Uh, this was simply done by choosing a parameter range which, which somehow resembled the parameters we have gotten from our afterglow fits and randomly varying them within the range. And then we fitted the light curves with both uh, a broken power law, like I showed you earlier, and also a smoothly joined broken power law, or a Boyerman function, as it's usually called in the camera reverse business. And then we just compared the results of the, of the power law fit to the model parameters we already know, because we created the work. And in the slides, next slide, delta x is the difference between the parameter of the fit and the parameter of the model. And <coughs> here you can show a, a distribution of, of relative errors in the value of, of P from alpha 1, value of P from alpha 2, and value of the initial opening angle of the jet. Now as you can see, here we have a slight overestimate in the value of P from the pre-break slope and an underestimate in the value of P from the post-break slope. And you can see that the, uh, the broken power law is, is worse in estimating parameters, which is uh, expected because the, the numerically calculated light curves are very smooth. Uh, <coughs> and you can also see that it's particularly true for the, for the opening angle, which the broken power law highly underestimates. But there is, however, uh, a peak here around zero, prominent peak, which uh, I actually took 
my rush ups and and I I sorted out the ones that got a bad chi square or the high chi, chi square for the fit. And if I include all results, this peak actually increases. So the chi square might not be uh, a good indicator of the of the quality of the resulting parameters, although it should indicate that the fit is good. <coughs> and this I also should mention that this is actually done. The, the jet estimate here, on the opening angle estimate, is done by correcting for the correct with the correct values of the initial energy and the and the density. So <coughs> if I do not correct for these values, I get a much broader distribution. So if you want to get this narrow distribution, you really have to know the the parameters. Of the, uh, or the values of the of the energy and and the density, but it's, I also tested this by simply varying uh, <coughs> by creating a Gaussian distribution of the or, or randomly picking the value I used in the, in the equation for the for the theta j there on the opening up estimate from time t in <coughs> and. I got the similar narrow results, so you only have to have uh, uh, an approximate estimate for the values. You don't need the actual. Yes. It looks like there are two. Here. Yeah, two different. Yeah, and you can see that this is actually uh, a plot of the relative distribution as a function of the model initial half opening angle, yeah. and here you can see that most of them lie here on this line. Yeah. Here, which is zero, which is correct, but then there's a population here and the population here also. And this actually, this solid line here is the is the average of, of all the points, thin average, and you can see there is a correlation between the initial opening angle of the model and the and the <coughs> the, uh, the uh, relative relative error in the estimate. And I also plotted here to to show you that the equation for the for the opening angle is actually correct. I just went into my data and found the time when the opening angle equals one over gamma, which is supposed to be the time of the jet break, instead of the time into the equation I got this by here, which is Almost zero, so you can see there are some variations used in the uh, because the equation for the op for the opening angle is an approximation to the model. So there are some variations due to that approximation, but the main difference comes to the difficulty of really determining the jet break time from the afterglow. So you can go into the details yeah. after this. Uh, maybe this would be a good time. I mean, you have the conclusion anyway on the last page, but yeah. maybe we should. Do you want to say some just in a half minute, and then we can have some time for questions. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, in four minutes. <laughs> well, I like refer to energy injections uh, in general increase the quality of the fit, which is normal because we increase the number of parameters. Uh, it is difficult to accurately determine the the P uh, and theta from the power of it. And then there's also uh, some recent observations by Swift, which are not so recent anymore, which show uh, a more complex early afterglow light curve, which cannot be explained with the standard model, but you have to have some more physics into the model. And then there are, in some cases, a correlation between the prompt high energy emissions and the lower energy counterpart, but in other, there is no correlation. So there are definitely many, many open questions in the after business. I thank you for your time. Okay, thanks very much. Time for uh, yes, I have a question before I have to leave. You said in the beginning that you had uh, you assume uh, lateral expansion in the shell uh, uh, with the sound speed, basically. Yes. 
And, uh, but it is normally said that when you try to fit uh, the, the break in the light curve, the achromatic break in the light curve, that overestimates the, the actual break. That is to say that uh, the, 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 expand, the sideways expansion is, is lower than, than yes. the inner sound speed uh, or the sound speed. Mm. And how much does that affect your fitting, for example, when, when you look at this uh, opening angle or how well you can fit that? Because when you fit it, you probably have a, a larger total break than what the observ observations uh, indicate. All right. I actually didn't test that, uh, so uh, I can't really tell. But if you if you have a fixed jet, you get uh, a sharper break, but it's not really sharp because of the because of both that the <coughs> the photon is is actually beamed entirely into mm -hmm. into this opening angle because they're smoothing around the edges, uh, and also because of the the curvature effect, you yeah. integrate over or an area, so. Mm -hmm you get a smooth break. You never get really sharp break. No, no, but I mean, this thing that, I mean, the, the reason yeah. that people are saying that that uh, that, that uh, the sideways, the lateral expansion can be as quick as, or as fast as yeah. the inner sound, yeah. is that, I mean, the total break, I mean, is much, is much smoother and, and not uh, yeah. in magnitude is as large as you would expect. I mean, in some cases they say that there's no lateral expansion at all. Okay, yeah, yeah I, I agree, this is, this yeah. is, this is just a basic yeah, I I just want to and I've actually explored uh, decreasing the 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 lateral speed and, and also making the, making it a function of the initial speed as was found by uh, I can't remember but there there have been numerical calculations Kumar and, and Panantescu probably mm -hmm. showing that lateral speed is less mm -hmm. than the speed of sound. Okay. Yes, just quickly, just these flares that you see, these prominent flares that you see in the early afterglow in the in swift state and the X-rays, is this anything you could sort of incorporate into your uh, It could be incorporated, but I need, I mean, I need some new physics because it, it really can't be explained with forward shock. As you can see from the, from the, I have an instantaneous injection, but I still have the smooth pump. Right. So, I can't really get the, the flaring. Structure. Sorry, what was that? Uh, uh, even though the the energy injections in my case are, are instantaneous, uh, I get. To go back. You see that this here is smooth and actually it doesn't fall back on the fast enough. Fast enough, mm -hmm. or and doesn't even fall back on the initial slope because you increase the yeah. luminosity. So, okay, and this is why you say that it has to be a, a reverse shock shape, or it, it's more more likely to be a reverse. Reverse or internal shocks. Internal, or, or internal shocks. Yeah. Yeah, but importantly, the, the, the number two part, the, the flat part, that's the this is the spectra from I, I actually No 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 I mean I mean in the X ray after you have this steep decay and then you have a flat uh, flat that, yes. And this some people have suggested this uh, this model could explain the flat part exactly. with a continuous yeah. energy injection. Okay. Or or a number of, of discrete shells or, or, okay. or some variations of thereof. Yes. Any other questions? Yeah, no. Um, no. By fitting these various uh, different models, is there a, any common physics that you can um, verify or determine, or even just get an idea of whether how, how much you can actually believe in the standard model? Well, uh, as I have shown here in the fits, you know, obviously mm -hmm. here is the standard model, mm -hmm. and in the left is the standard model with short curves, and you can see. In, in every case, you get the, the general picture of the afterglow light. And I have yet to see uh, an afterglow light. I haven't fitted all of them. It's a working process. But <clears throat> in, in all cases, I get the general overall structure of the light curves and spectra. But there are these variations here that are, are most interesting. And, and now, due to the 
in good results from the shift satellite, the early optical light and the connection between the prompt emissions and the optical, and how that all, all connects. Mm -hmm. And so far, there has been no solid model that explains in detail the, the shift results and the prompt emission from from first physics, mm -hmm. or, or even even approximate physics like mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. um, this polarization comment that you had, uh, could you <laughs> you said Can something you about no no you said something about uh, other effects except for the geometrical. Uh, well, if mm, if we have if you could draw it, please. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that would be good. What I assume is that the, the magnetic field is, is actually random here, when viewed head on. But when viewed head on, we have a very thin shell. Yeah. So it is mainly in this direction. And <coughs> because of the, the beaming, then light emitted in this direction, which is and parallel to the magnetic field that's emitted to this direction or to us. And <coughs> now assuming the homogeneity, we have to break the symmetry of the field that is. And if I saw this, you've probably seen this image. But in the optical in the optical range, the brightest part of the pattern view is the axis. Because uh, <coughs> the solar circuit is slowing down, and when we view at the axis, we are seeing the oldest part of the afterglow, or, or in the evolution. So it is, it is the brightest, and it's also the one that has the polarization. But if we view head on the polarization, or, or on axis, the polarization cancels out all times. But if we are off axis here, we only get a part the polarization and we get get a net total polarization. Uh, but then there are other methods of, of getting if we have not this random magnetic field but some structure here, maybe some blobs with constant or with with a magnetic field that is aligned, then we can also get polarization. Which can actually vary more differently than, than, than our simple model. And also, and we can also, if we, even if we have the, the random magnetic field, if the, if the energy density of the forward shock also has this blob structure, we can get different kind of polarization. Because then we are varying the, the intensity and different polarization. So basically, you have to break the symmetry somehow. Questions? Any questions? Yes, good. Did I understand you right that you said that it's very unsensitive to where in the cone the observer is? The light curve is very, very insensitive. No. But the polarization is. It's highly sensitive to the to the viewing angle, and, okay. and actually to get this curve, you have to view it just on the edge. And there's also uh, I did work on uh, an X-ray flash or X-ray rich gamma ray burst. It's believed to be normal gamma ray burst viewed off axis, and there we actually used the the <coughs> The viewing angle to explain a very flat early light curve. So if you are viewing up axis you get well, normally you get something like like this. And then you get you can get this structure if you're viewing off axis. So you don't see the light until you are till the beaming all widens up so you can see some Mm -hmm. That's number 
further questions? Then let's thank uh, <laughs>